What's up guys, Donald here now I'm back bringing this one. WrestleMania 28. This took place on April 1st, 2012 from the Lund Sunlight Stadium in Miami, Florida. Getting a pay view record pay per view buy rate of 1,300,000 buys. Which what a number that was and take that rock haters. I mean, do you honestly think this pay per view would have drew those kind of numbers if The Rock hadn't come back? Absolutely not. Totally, definitely not. So this, of course, is headlined by humongous main event, once in a lifetime. Ha! <laughs> John Cena taking on The Rock in a big dream match, and also Hell in a Cell, end of an era. Triple H versus The Undertaker. So I definitely think this is the best. The best P, the best show, the best WrestleMania of the PG era. Definitely the biggest one, obviously, with two really big matches here. Also, got WWE Championship match between. We've got John Cena and. What's his face? Oh, fucking hell, right, let's try again. We've got CM Punk versus Chris Jericho for the WWE Championship as well, so. I think they had some bad matches on this, but I think. Those three matches, Punk, Jericho, Trip, Take a Triple H and Cena Rock all delivered big time. But I'll get into that more in a bit. So yeah, let's just dive right into it really. We kick off with a match that caused a lot of controversy at the time. But it's perhaps the most unintentionally brilliant move in quite a while. It was once again a singles match for the World Heavyweight Championship. Daniel Bryan defending the championship against Sheamus. Now Daniel Bryan was in his World Heavyweight title reign. Wish he'd won the World Heavyweight title cashing money in the bank at TLC 2011. But then Daniel Bryan turned heel and thought that was a great move at the time. I thought Daniel Bryan was an awesome heel at this time. He was girlfriend of AJ Lee and yeah Daniel Bryan started to get really over as a prick heel. Sne little sneaky heel who would do all kinds of dirty stuff. I mean, I love I love some of the way he used to treat AJ at times. I mean, he told he would tell it to shut up and that. And one of the most hilarious segments of the whole thing on SmackDown is where Daniel Bryan made AJ tell everyone what what she why she loved him and what she loved about him and all that. <laughs> but <coughs> sorry, well, that was a great segment. We got Sheamus winning the 2012 Royal Rumble. End up challenging Daniel Bryan for the championship. Now. The build up this match wasn't all that memorable really, I mean I can't really remember much about the build up for this match and it was only two years ago so kind of being that good if I can't remember it but we all knew Sheamus was getting a strong push at the time he, he'd had his failed main event runs in 2009-2010 but then 2011 he improved quite a bit, improved his all round act and by the time he got another push in 2012 he was far more ready to be a main event player than he was in 2010 so yeah this was also Daniel Bryan had started doing this thing now known as the yes movement the yes chance started in Daniel Bryan's world title reign and I honestly, I honestly think I probably just started off as a joke I mean because Daniel Bryan's obnoxiously celebrated the title when he was going yes 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 and just because wrestling's that weird, something like that could get over so strong. So he started doing yes before his matches. Go on, because he's a world heavyweight champion. Yes, yes. This call, this whole yes thing, really took a big turn on this night, and particularly the raw after this. I just want to point out one thing. I loved the yes chance before everybody else got on the bandwagon. I loved the yes chances from day one. I May mean, I remember at the time? The lad went up to me work and he goes, why can I hear you saying yes to yourself sometimes? I'm like, oh yeah, nothing. Because sometimes I would yes, do yes to myself when I was going about my business at work and that. And people at work actually picked up on it. So, yeah, we get this. Oh, well, here we go. Sheamus comes out first. Daniel Bryan. We get a lot of yes chants for the first, really the first time the yes chants stood out. We were signs and all that, so... Daniel Bryan. The bell rings. Daniel Bryan gets AJ on the apron. Good luck, Kiss. Sheamus hits the bro kick. One, two, three. After 18 seconds, Sheamus is a world heavyweight champion. Oh, our fans were outraged over this. 
And I'm not gonna lie here. At the time, I was one of them. I was like, rubble, 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 rubble. I was one of those ones that was quite pissed off about what happened at the time as well. I thought it was a stupid move at the time. Thought they were went out. I thought they were trying to bury Daniel Bryan, but if that was honestly the intention there, knock Daniel Bryan down a peg or two, it didn't work because. This for me only really es this is when Daniel Bryan's popularity started getting over big. Daniel Bryan's popular like the next night on Raw, fans were chanting yes all night through various segments and all that sort. But I think it was a bad move up because if WWE's intention was to get Sheamus over as strong champion and knock Daniel Bryan down a peg or two, it did not work because and I think this is a you've got to feel a bit sorry for Sheamus here. I think a lot of fans resented Sheamus for that. But Daniel Bryan only got more popular after this. I mean, a hell of a lot more popular. The Yes t shirt came out, and now here we are two years later. And this is on the Wednesday after the Raw where Daniel Bryan got announced to be in the WWE. Face the Triple H, and hopefully, hopefully in the main event of this year's WrestleMania. I just hope he wins the WWE Championship because uh, there's been a two year journey for Daniel Bryan after losing his world title here and oh, just because right now Daniel Bryan's the most popular guy in wrestling and has been for quite some time and one of the most over guys in a long time and I just hope WWE does the right thing and puts the world heavyweight title on him at this year's WrestleMania. So yeah, that's so. It all start here. Sheamus, New World Heavyweight Champion, and all that. Now we got a singles match this with Kane versus Randy Orton, and this was oh, this is a decent match. Kane had come back with his mask in the end of 2011. That whole scene, if you do, was a really big disappointment in my opinion. Just was not a big fan of that feud. The whole embrace of hate crap. Because of course they end up not embracing the hate after all, which is like, ugh, alright. And then obviously Cena had beaten Kane as well. And unfortunately poor Zack Ryder got dragged into this whole feud and ended up getting buried as a result as well. So but then Kane and Orton were two guys who didn't really have anything for WrestleMania. So they just put them together as kind of a throwaway feud. I mean, Kane attacked Orton on SmackDown and revealed... Because in 2011, Randy Orton beat Kane in a match. When Kane was unmasked and then Kane shook Orton's hand, so... Kane kind of made the excuse of the... Uh, the what, um, the Kane... Because uh, Randy Orton had... Because um, Kane had showed respect, so... Kane was no longer a monster. So he had to be that monster again, and he... Wanted to beat down Randy Orton. So, yeah... So, so the fear was alright. Not... I mean, I don't know if it was build up to this or Extreme Rules. It might have been after this where Kane had beaten up Orton's dad, Bob Orton. So then Randy Orton had uh, kidnapped Kane's dad, Paul Bearer. And didn't, didn't Kane shove Paul Bearer down a meat freezer or something daft like that, I think? It's kind of weird, though, because I, I vividly remember storylines from 15, 16 years ago. But I sometimes have trouble remembering things from two years ago. So yeah, we get this match. It's a good match. Not a great match, but definitely a solid enough match. This probably should have opened up the show, to be honest with you. So, Kane looked decent. I mean, Kane's always been a decent worker. I think Randy Orton's good at what he does. This is Randy Orton. I think Randy Orton's face was starting to get a bit stale at this point, though. He had that great one of Chrissy in 2011, and for a little more over a year, Randy Orton's floundered a bit in WWE. Before he turned heel last year and joined the authority and all that. And then, I mean, a surprise finish as well that Kane defeats Randy Orton for choke time off the ropes. I think most people fully expected Orton to win this match, and so did I. So that was a surprise. Now, next up for the Intercontinental title getting defended against WrestleMania Cody Rhodes versus The Big Show. I mean, I think Cody Rhodes brought some prestige back to the Intercontinental title. After a few years, the Intercontinental title being a meaningless belt. Cody won it in 2011 and brought back the old Intercontinental title design, which I thought was an awesome touch. Absolutely loved that. Would actually love if they actually brought the old Winged Eagle WF Championship back as well, but they probably won't. 
But yeah, I just thought, yeah, I, I like that old, old school Intercontinental title design. But it was a great move. And I think Cody did a really good job as Intercontinental Champion as well. Uh, but then he started feeling for the Big Show in early 2011. It all started where Cody Rhodes was mocking the Big Show for having an embarrassing WrestleMania record. He would point out things like he got knocked out by Floyd Mayweather, got beaten in a silver match by Aki Bono, and just all sorts of stuff. I mean, the Big Show had never really had a big WrestleMania mo moment in his career. He'd lost most of his big matches. I think he'd won a couple of matches, but the matches he won were fairly meaningless. And I think they were all tag matches. So, yeah, just stuff like that. So, Cody Rhodes would come out in the middle of Big Show's matches and introduce an embarrassing Big Show WrestleMania moment on the Titan Tron, which I thought was really funny. So then, Big Show ends up getting pissed off, ends up challenging Cody for the Intercontinental title of WrestleMania, and they had a decent match, but it was just went over five minutes, so it didn't really get much time at all. I mean, Cody did the best he could, but like I say, in the five minutes, you're not really going to do much at all. I mean, this is the thing about WrestleMania, they often they often leave time for skits and other things, so sometimes a lot of match, sometimes t matches get dicked for time, and it's been that way since all the WrestleMania, really. Then after, so after five minutes, solid match, the big show knocks out Cody Rhodes to become the new Intercontinental Champion. So the big show gets his WrestleMania moment. It didn't last long, though, as Cody won the Intercontinental title back, so not a bad match at all, really. Big show beats Cody Rhodes now. Next up, we get the Divas match tonight. Uh, Beth Phoenix and Eve Torres facing Kelly Kelly and Maria Menounos. I don't know, I don't know whatever the fuck her name is. I mean, she just, I don't know exactly what she does, but I know she's some American celebrity of some kind. I don't really care about her that much. So, yeah, she got a spot on WrestleMania. And I can't even really remember the build-up to this one, to be honest. I know Beth and Kelly had been feuding throughout 2011 and that, so... There was a connection there, and Eve Torres had turned heel on Zack Ryder not too long before. And to be fair, during the end, last run in WWE, I think Eve Torres did was a really good heel. I think because she was a babyface most of the time, but when Eve was a face, she didn't really have a gimmick or anything. So I think when she turned heel, that was a nice surprise. She did really well, and this was an okay match. Not could have been a could have been a hell of a lot worse, put it that way. Because Maria Menounos had no real experience, but she did all right for a beginner and all that. And so yeah, it wasn't a bad match, but it wasn't definitely not worth going out your way to see. So Kelly and Maria beat Beth and Eve, and that's about it really. Now next up, the show stealing match at WrestleMania 28, end of an era, uh, Hell in a Cell. The Undertaker versus Triple H with Shawn Michaels as special guest referee. People cry on about, oh, it wasn't the end of it even though. No, Taker and Triple H didn't retire. I think a lot of people in the IWC, YWC get sand in the vagina sometimes over silly little things like that. What the end of the era meant was this was the last time you'd get these guys all together in a high profile, all together at the same time in a big situation like this. So. I think a lot of people taking the whole end of an era thing too seriously, getting a bit too upset because it wasn't one of the taking Triple H's last matches. They, yeah, I definitely think some people on the internet have get sand in the vaginas far too often. So yeah, this all started back the night after the Royal Rumble because oh, we all know how the WrestleMania 27, the whole Undertaker Triple H match where Triple H beat up the Undertaker throughout the match. Undertaker won, but then. He was powerless to leave the ring on his own power and got carried out. So apparently, as the months went on, Undertaker sat at home and it fested him and bothered him and all and so much. He did not want that to be the image of the Undertaker that the fans remembered. So, so by this point, Triple H had, in the meantime, Triple H had become the on-air CEO of the WWE. So he felt really, pretty much his real life thing, his real life uh, being number two behind Vince was acknowledged on screen, so Triple H was the CEO of the company in a suit and tie and all that, not really wrestling much anymore. So the night after the Royal Rumble, The Undertaker returned to WWE, uh, and in a situation like last year, looked at Triple H, looked at the WrestleMania sign, 
And what I thought, Triple H shook his head in a patronising way and then patronisingly patted the Undertaker on the shoulder as if to say, no, it's not going to happen. Now, Triple H's explanation for turning the Undertaker challenge down was he knows what he has to do to end the streak. He has to end the Undertaker. He knows that, um, he knows that um, if they have another match and Triple H won't stop this time, he'll beat the Undertaker up so badly because he knows... Because he knows that Undertaker, he knows what he has to do with beating the streak. He has to destroy the Undertaker, end his career, and because Triple H is CEO now, he sees Undertaker as an asset. He doesn't want to end the Undertaker brand and all that. It was a great segment where, because Undertaker challenged and Undertaker did a video talking about how he didn't want that to be his, the image of him and lasting the ages. He wants his vengeance in exchange. Undertaker will give Triple H one more chance at immortality to end the streak. Then Shawn Michaels ended up getting involved in the storyline. It was an amazing pro of him and Triple H, where him cut on Triple H, where he told Triple H to look him in the eye and tell him that he doesn't want to end the streak. Trying to, try to persuade Triple H to accept the challenge. Triple H did, sell, did say no. Uh, he said it was not about you. It's not about that anymore. Um, I've got more responsibilities now. I'm not going to do it. I don't need this. So yeah, some of the some of the promo Shawn Michaels cut in the build up of this match were outstanding, and so were Triple H's as well. So after weeks, it all culminated the night after elimination chamber. The Undertaker came out, did one last big attempt to go Triple H into fighting him. Triple H consistently said no. Undertaker was trying everything in his power to try everything in his power to. Get Triple H to fight him, called him a coward, all sorts of stuff. But then he finally brought the cameras back by saying he finally figured it out. He finally, he finally understood why. It's because the uh, Triple H knew that he couldn't do what his best friend Shawn Michaels couldn't do, and that was end the streak. And the Triple H always knew in his heart that Shawn Michaels was better than him, and that's what pissed Triple H off. Triple H. Threw his tie off and said, I can beat you. Uh, Sean Michaels got soft, but I know damn sure well I can, so you're on. But if we're going to do this, we're going to go all the way. Hell on a cell. Which crowd puffed for that, which was kind of funny because at the time people were whinging about, nah, I don't really want to see Triple H and The Undertaker again. But once he said it was a Hell in a Cell match, the, the tunes definitely, they definitely changed the tune after that. So, yeah, shit was on. And then Shawn Michaels next week came out so he knew he was going to win. And he knows that because he's a special guest referee for this match. So, yeah, this, so this is a whole, this is a four year storyline, really. Starting with Undertaker with Shawn at WrestleMania 25. And then culminating right here. So the build up was awesome. I mean, Shawn Michaels uh, suggested that, isn't it ironic the guys whose career you ended two years ago? Could quite possibly end the streak. Undertaker threatened Sean, saying, "This match has to remain me and pure. It has to be done right, or I'll f or I'll beat the shit out of you." They admit the um, they didn't they they acknowledged on air that every time Sean Michaels guest refereed a match, that something controversial would happen. Triple H had never lost a match to Sean Michaels referee. Which asked me one question, why do they keep hiring Shawn Michaels to be guest referees? Which proves to be such an incompetent referee over the years, but that's what it is. So yeah, the build up of this was really, really, really good. Promos you cut on each other and all that. End of an era. Undertaker Triple H Hell in a Cell. Shawn Michaels a guest referee. They had the whole Metallica the memory 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 remains music to build up this match. The video packages were awesome. So we get the match and then Shawn Michaels comes out as guest referee first. Triple H comes out of a cool entrance, walking through the uh, what was like a like a battlefield type thing with the green lights and all that. Then the Undertaker of course makes it classic Undertaker WrestleMania entrance. Undertaker WrestleMania entrances get me every single time. Love the Undertaker's WrestleMania entrances, always amazing. Then Undertaker takes off his coat. He's cut all his hair off now. He's got a mohawk. Hell in a Cell comes down. And we get this match in. Wow. An amazing match. 
this match was better than WrestleMania 27 and then some. I thought, oh, just amazing, amazing, amazing match. Uh, much like Undertaker and Sean at WrestleMania 25, so many big moves, so many twists and turns. What a story these guys told as well. Uh, Undertaker started off hot and heavy, uh, beaten. He got the best of Triple H throughout mostly opening sequence. Then Triple H ended up taking over, really started beating and taking down for steel chair. And Shawn Michaels' his performance was absolutely fantastic in this month. I mean, this is another time I was really wrong. Because I remember the time thinking that Shawn Michaels didn't really need to um, referee this match. But boy, was I wrong because just Shawn Michaels' body language and acting and selling and all that was one of the things that really made this match even more special. So... What I loved was the Triple H was telling Sean to stop the match, end it or he, end it or I will, he would say. And Sean Michaels, he, you'd see him, his heart was torn. Should he end it? Should he not? Undertaker was adamantly declared to do, don't stop this match. And then Tri Sean's telling Triple H, just pin him, please. You know he's not going to give up. Come on, Triple H, that's enough. Then, yeah. So then we got a bit where it looks like Shawn Myers is going to stop, but then the Undertaker puts the Hell's Gate in him. We get some amazing spots, some amazing near falls. Uh, Triple H kicked out Undertaker, kicked out the Pedigree. Triple H kicked out the Tombstone, but they only did one kick out of each move, so didn't overdo it a bit. Then Shawn Michaels super kicks the Undertaker. Triple H hits the Pedigree again. I was like, no! Undertaker kicks out again. Crowd are biting on every single near fall. And as the match wears, goes down to the end, you can see the Undertaker's clearly in, getting in control by the end. Triple H, is, Triple H is running out of fight, running out of energy. The Undertaker is starting to dominate towards the end. Uh, Triple H goes for a sledgehammer. Oh, he picked up the sledgehammer. Undertaker steps on it. Uh, hits him with a chair. No, no, no that's not the end. Eventually, Triple H in the corner, he runs it with a sledgehammer. Hit, uh, Undertaker grabs it, throws the sledgehammer away. Hits Triple H in the head with a sledgehammer. Triple H defiant at the very end. Uh, trying everything, trying his hardest to stay in the match. Undertaker hits the tombstone. Shawn Michaels, Shawn Michaels counts the pinfall. One, two, three. Undertaker is 20 and owned. What a roller coaster of a ride this match was. It really was. I thought this is an unbelievable match, to be honest with you. And I'm going to say it now on par with Undertaker Sean at 25. Not quite as good as that, but close. The second best match in the streak. Five stars, all that. And I would actually say the second best match of the PG era as well. This is a match that I actually think is better than John Cena saying put money in the bank too. But that's just my personal opinion because I just. Loved the whole story and what a culmination it was. A great four year journey. Starting with Undertaker and Sean at 25, Undertaker retiring Sean at 26, Triple H destroying the Undertaker at 27 but losing, Undertaker getting his redemption, Sean might as a guest referee. So Undertaker and Sean, oh, honestly, Sean Michaels has brilliantly sold this. I mean, the emotion Sean Michaels showed as a referee was absolutely fantastic. Uh, Sean and Undertaker hug at the end of the match. And then Sean and Undertaker pick Triple H up. They all embrace in the ring and walk out together. And that, that was a classic WrestleMania. This is what End of an Era was all about. That's what End of an Era meant. It was just amazing, amazing stuff. Uh, can't praise this match enough for it. was one of the best WrestleMania matches of all time. It's amazing. So Undertaker is now 20 and 0. And that's that. Now we get a match before the two big main events now. We had a 12-man tag team match to determine the general manager of both Raw and SmackDown, which teamed Johnny, uh, Captain Bar and John Laurinaitis. On John, Johnny's team, we got David Otonga, Mark Henry, Dolph Ziggler, Jack Swagger, The Miz and Joe McIntyre. Uh, we've got then Team Teddy, Teddy Long's team with Santino Amarella, R-Truth, Kofi Kingston, Zack Ryder, The Great Carly and Booker T. And I just wasn't that big on this storyline, to be honest with you. I think this storyline would have... Because who really cared? I mean, the brand split was over anyway, so... Did it really matter if someone was general manager of both shows? 
Not really, in my opinion. If you've done this in, uh, let's say, WrestleMania 20 or 20, 21, 2004, 2005, it would have made more sense. It would have been a lot of bigger match than it was, but it was 2012, the brand split was over, no one really cared, and we all saw this for what it was. An excuse to get most of the mid-card crew on the card, give them a spot on the card. I mean, John Laurinaitis, I thought was an awesome heel, an awesome heel GM on Raw. Because John Laurinaitis had been talent in relations for years in real life. Never been an on-screen character, but if you were on the internet, you knew exactly who he was and you'd heard a lot of stories about him. A lot of people talking shit about him, calling him an idiot and a prick and all that. So, he really only came on screen during the whole punk, punk summer, a punk storyline for the money in the bank. Then slowly by slowly, he would appear more and more. And I think Johnny, he, just came, he was a natural heel. Just something about him that made him so hateable and he was really, really good in his role. Had a few to say on Punk. Was a general manager of Raw. So yeah, I, I thought, and then for some reason he asked John Laurinaitis about three months after this at No Way Out and I don't really understand why because I think they had a really good character in him there. I, I wouldn't mind seeing him come back someday but I just don't know why they asked him to be honest with you. So yeah, this match was alright. Nothing special, but nothing too bad either. Yeah, the ending was pretty bad though. The match was like, yeah, it was okay. Most of the guys came and did the spots and all that. Yeah. This ended up down to missing uh, Zack Ryder. And, because Zack Ryder, uh, Zack Ryder got himself over on his own in 2011. Doing the YouTube show and all that. Fans got behind him and all that. And then WWE took them a while to get behind him, but then the he pushed him the US title in TLC 2011, but then, for me it was like, it was a big fuck you to the fans, because then they, then they buried him shortly after this, it was like, so they built him up just to knock him down, it was like a fuck you to the fans, saying fuck you for um, liking who we don't want you to like, and he did the whole storyline where Eve turned, he looked like a mug, Eve turned on him and all that, he just looked like a real mug, and I don't think Zack Ryder's ever got over that. Miz gets the victory, so Laurinaitis' team win and all that, but that's whatever. Now, next up, we got a WWE Championship match CM Punk versus Chris Jericho. And this was, you could say this was sort of a dream match for me at the time. I mean, they had wrestled before, but not quite on this grand scale, so after the whole Summer of Punk thing and the whole Triple H Kevin Nash storyline, that Punk lost a bit of momentum, but then. He got it back when he won the WWE Championship against Alberto Del Rio Survivor Series 2011, which started his 434-day title reign. Which is probably that's probably going to be Punk's legacy when he, if he never comes back now, when when Punk's done for good, that'll probably be Punk's legacy in wrestling. That big WWE Championship reign, which lasted all of 2012 and ended the 2000 Rumble 2013 against the Rock, I mean. The longest WWE Championship reign since 1987. I mean, we don't really, we haven't really had title reigns like that for years and years and years. So, I thought it was an awesome title reign. So, uh, his biggest WrestleMania match here was Chris Jericho. Chris Jericho had come back at the start of 2012. The whole not talking gimmick thing was a bit weird at first, but I don't know. Then, then he started talking, talking about how. People like Punk had stolen his ideas and his concepts and all that. Uh, Punk calling himself the best in the world, but doesn't everyone know that Chris Jericho is in fact the best in the world in everything that he does? That sort of thing. Chris Jericho did not win the Raw Rumble that year. Ended up becoming a one ten by winning a Battle Royal on Raw. So yeah, it was the feud really started of just best in the world versus talking promos of how each of us was better than the other one. Punk called himself best in the world, but He's only the WWE Championship because Jericho has been gone. So Jericho has come back for one reason, one reason he owes me. To beat CM Punk for that WWE Championship and prove to everyone that Chris Jericho, in fact, is the best in the world at what he does and all that. But which was fine. But I think the storyline, they needed a more of a personal reason a few than that. And they got that a few weeks before where CM Punk, where Chris Jericho revealed it had been Digging up some, digging up some of Punk's past history and his family and all that, and he found out that um, Zayvrant say I'm Punk's straight edge because his dad 
alcoholic, which is 100% true. Um, I can only I can only assume the research that Chris Jericho did was watching Ring of Honor DVDs because. Punk did that exact same storyline in Ring of Honor with Raven back in the day. And all that whole Punk dad being an alcoholic is absolutely true as well. So, And then he then um, talked about how his sister has uh, problems with his prescription pills. And the really, really funny one was um, when he talked about, well, he said his mother's a nice person, but then he found out. An interesting fact that um, CM Punk's parents' wedding day took place after Punk's birth birth date, which um, made say and punk the legal definition of a bastard. I thought <laughs> oh, that was a really funny line, so yeah, I like the aspect of the storyline there. Uh, I think it'd give punk, give their fans, give punk some sympathy as a baby face. Got some heat on Chris Jericho for being an arsehole, heel, all that. So I thought that whole storyline where Jericho going after punk's family, his dad being an alcoholic and all that, definitely made the storyline a lot better. Because best in the world versus best in the world's fine, but this actually gave a personal issue to the feud now. So yeah, I just thought that was really, I thought that was a really good way, good uh, direction to go in. Then right before the match, John Laurinaitis declared that if Chris uh, Punk gets disqualified, he'll lose the title. So we get this match, and I don't, I think it's a slightly overrated match, and a disappointing match. But, but that's all. That's probably my fault though, because. Gordon had ridiculous expect. I was expecting this to be an amazing wrestler match. I had. I probably did have too high expectations for this match, and that's my fault. That's on me. But this was a great match, though. I'm not going to deny that it was a entertaining match. I thought it was a bit weird though because they started off by having um, Jericho talk shit about Punk and Punk getting close to being disqualified. So. Then like halfway through the match, he just sort of abandoned that story and had a wrestling match instead. So I'm not sure what happened there, but it was like the, this might sound like weird criticism, but it was like they were they were telling one story, then they just ended the story and went for a different story for no apparent reason. I think it's a slow build of match, so it took a while to get going. I think the last five minutes or so was really really hot. Crowd were into it by the end. They weren't that into it at first, but by the end they were getting really into it. I mean, CM Punk and Chris Jericho are both, they have good chemistry in my opinion, but I do prefer the Extreme Rules match to this one. The Chicago Street Fight they had. So, but they always have good matches, and after a while CM Punk gets Chris Jericho on the Anaconda Vice. Chris Jericho taps out, and that's that. CM Punk retains the WWE Championship. I would definitely call this a great match, but do think it's a bit overrated. It's not a classic match. Some people make it out it's, it's a classic wrestling match. It wasn't. It was just a standard great match. Now all of this leads to the big main event. One year in the making. Once in a lifetime. John Cena versus The Rock. I mean, we all know. I'll talk more about the whole once in a lifetime thing in the next video. But this one's this video is now specific just to this. The build up of this match and this match only. This is not about the WrestleMania 29 match yet, which was um. So it all started when The Rock came back in 2011. I explained some of the build-up in the WrestleMania 27 video. In the build-up WrestleMania 7, John Cena and The Rock talked shit about each other. Uh, but on the Raw before WrestleMania 27, Cena hit The Rock with the AA. Rock retaliated at WrestleMania 27 by costing John Cena the WWE Championship against The Miz. So the next night on Raw, the Raw after WrestleMania 27, John Cena called out The Rock for getting in his personal business. Like, then The Rock came out and said to Cena, what the hell did you think was going to happen? And what was great, The Rock said how he respects John Cena, respects what he's done. But the fact is, The Rock just doesn't like you. And John Cena said, right, well, let's give it these, these people want a match. So he challenged uh, The Rock to a match. The Rock responded, be careful what you wish for. So, the uh, Rock declared that let's do something that's never been done before. Let's make this the biggest match of all time. John Cena vs. The Rock, WrestleMania 28. So, that's right, the WrestleMania main event was announced a year in advance, which I thought was really unique and a cool concept, to be honest with you. I liked it anyway. I reckon some people, I bet mean, some in the wider we see probably complained about it, because they complain about everything, but. I thought that was a really, that was a great way to go. 
And because the rock was in Hollywood for most of the time, they were able to stretch the feud out a full year. I mean, John Cena was off in other feuds. Sometimes the rock would post something on something on the internet talking about Cena and all that. Cena would talk bad about the rock in public. Most notably on an Australian tour, John Cena. The video that came out on YouTube where John Cena was trashing the rock for not being here. Where's the where's the people champ? I'm here on this tour and what's the rock doing type thing. And then they actually teamed up with Survivor Series 2011 to face Awesome Truth, which I'm not going to get into massive detail on that because it's all out there. But then after that match, the rock rock bottom Cena as well. Then so as 2012 wore on, the rock started making regular appearances again to to build up to this match. Uh, it all started um, right after the Elimination Chamber where John Cena cut a work shoot promo on the rock which it annoys when it, like every time a wrestler is a realistic promo, people the like IWC why so go, it's a shoot promo. I think some people don't understand the difference between a shoot promo and a work shoot promo. This was a work shoot promo where John Cena was talking bad about the rocks. Talk about how he doesn't wait well, was calling him Dwayne Johnson how he doesn't personally respect him and all that. A lot of things that he'd said before, but you could see the passion in Cena's voice and when he was saying it, it was like, so you could tell that he definitely believed it. And what I loved about, I actually, believe it or not, I actually loved the whole build up to this match. I mean, just to show people I'm not biased because I'm going to talk, I'm going to, I'll probably criticise the WrestleMania 29 build up, so I will say that I, I absolutely loved the build of WrestleMania 28. I'm not going to lie about that. What I loved about it though is, you got the sense that, and this doesn't happen often in wrestling, in wrestling these days, that John Cena and The Rock did not like each other, for real. You could, so, you, so you could believe everything that was said about each other and all that. And I think that's what gets wrestling over when, when people can suspend the disbelief and believe. Because I think there was, there was definitely a lot of real tension between Cena and Rock. But I think they were just exaggerating them all out there. So The Rock comes out, talks about Cena, how... When he came back, he said he was never going away, he meant it. But John Cena took that the total wrong way, he made a big deal out of it. What The Rock meant is he wasn't going to be on the show every week, and that's not what was expected. So, yes. Yeah, so. Then he started talking smack about each other. Cena actually got the better of The Rock quite a few times, and that was by design. Because I think they wanted to try and, the build up, try and get, the Rock, uh, get the fans to believe that Cena and Rock were on the same level. But I think most fans saw Rock as a bigger star than Cena, which he is. But so they try to make Cena look as strong as possible in the build-up for this match. Uh, Love the whole history lesson in Boston. One of the favorite, probably the favorite night of the whole build-up was um, the rap, rap versus Rock concert. Like he did the year before, Cena came out in his old Fogonomics attire, cut an old-school Cena rap Fogonomics style promo on the Rock. Then later that night, Rock cut a blistering Rock concert on Cena. I mean, to be fair to The Rock, he did such a good job of controlling the crowd, having the crowd the power of his hands, talking loads of smack about Cena. It was all good stuff. Then the face to faces and all that. So, they had a lot to say about each other. It was really good. This is a match I, I really, really wanted to see this match. I was looking forward to it quite a bit. So we're in Miami, of course, the Rock's hometown. Then we get music performance to start off. MJ Machine Gun Kelly performed Invincible for John Cena, which I thought was absolutely hilarious because Machine, Machine Gun Kelly obviously probably doesn't know his stuff. He talked about how John Cena was an underdog and how he was behind John Cena. And when he said that, he got booed out of the building, which I thought was fucking hilarious. So John Cena comes out first. Then Flowrider plays two songs before the Rock was feeling and wild ones. Then after that, the Rock came out because I'm not normally a big fan of musical performances at WrestleMania, but I like this one because I felt it did a good job of making this match feel even bigger. This was once in a lifetime, apparently. Cena Rock once in a lifetime. That was emphasised over and over and over again. The build that was on the post was everything. Then The Rock comes out next to an absolutely humongous pop. I mean, if the stadium had a roof, that would have blew the roof off the stadium. A humongous pop from The Rock in Miami. And we get the match, and I thought this was a great match, to be honest with you. I think it was a, about a thousand times better than the 29 match. 
Some people might not like this match, but I think it really delivered thing. Yeah, just entertain a match, crowd it into everything they were doing. And this just felt like a huge main event because it had been built up as such. Yeah. The only problem, it, went, it probably did go quite a long time because you could see about 15, 20 minutes into this match, the Rock was, the Rock was gassed out a bit. His, his stamina wasn't there like he used to be. So, and I give, I should give Cena a hell of a lot of credit for this. Cena became a ring general in this match, and I think Cena's the one who really carried most of the action, to be honest with you. And that's just how I feel. I think Cena did a great job throughout this match. There was some great near falls towards the end. And yeah, just really good match, crowded into it, and all that. Uh, a great finish because Rock hit a. Uh, what do you call it? A crossbody off the ropes. Cena rolled through, picked up the rock for a AA, which to be fair, that's pretty good. Cena's very, very strong. Hits the AA, the rock kicks out. I think it's his second AA he kicked out of. Cena couldn't believe it. So Cena gets up, goes to mock the rock by going for a people's elbow. The rock skips up, catches Cena, hits the big rock bottom. One, two, three, and wow! The Rock beats John Cena, which, to be fair, that's another WrestleMania main event where I just got the prediction completely and totally wrong. I mean, I was, I was adamant that Cena was going to win this match. I was certain of that. So I was honestly genuinely surprised when The Rock did win this match, but it was a great surprise because I was really happy that The Rock got to win this match. For us. I think it shocked a lot of people as well because I'd say... Most people predicted John Cena would beat The Rock, and that would be that. But of course, that didn't happen. Yeah, I think most, I think most people thought what happened at 29 would happen that uh, Rock would lose and then endorse Cena. But to the surprise of virtually everyone, The Rock won, and that started. Um, that was a big basis of the build-up for WrestleMania 29, which I'll get into in the next one. But I'll say right now, I thought Cena Rock won was awesome match. Really good match, really liked it, and a great victory for The Rock. So that closes out WrestleMania 28, which I thought was a borderline great WrestleMania. Some of the undercard wasn't that good, but I think, and take a Triple H, Punk Jericho, Cena Rock were all great matches. So, and then we got a couple, then we got a memorable moment with Sheamus winning the world title in 12, 18 seconds. So I thought that's enough, really. To, Bump this up to a great WrestleMania, a borderline great WrestleMania. Not amongst the absolute elite WrestleManias of all time, but definitely a great WrestleMania in my opinion. Uh, definitely the best WrestleMania of the PG era in my opinion as well. Um, Alpha now back for the final installment, WrestleMania 29.